Okay, welcome everybody. We are here to talk about accessibility enhancements in Articulate Storyline. It was one of the good things to come out of 2020. So Storyline uh, started making course, making their software um, able to generate accessible courses about three or four years ago with um, Storyline 2 is when they started. And in the last year and a half, they've had a really big push to make sure that they're being as um, close, they can, uh, you can comply as close as you can with accessibility guidelines, such as the web content accessibility guidelines known as WCAG, and also the Section 508 standard. So what I'll be sharing with you in this program is about what's new. So I won't be doing a soup to nuts, everything that you need to do, but what's different than it used to be. So for those of you who are new, it'll still be a good uh, overview. Just realize it is not the 100% picture of accessibility. So this overview is gonna focus on what's different. If any of you are interested in a deep dive, we do have a full day workshop coming up, I think in three weeks, uh, March, I don't remember the date, 23rd, I should know this. Um, you can uh, register for that on our website if you're interested. That's a full day program or it's a deep dive of how to, but we're gonna focus on what's new and different. And it's a lot of really good stuff. It's not perfect, but it's some good stuff. So the first thing that is new and different is the concept of focus order. Even the name is different. It used to be called tab order. So tab order and now focus order is the order that somebody would navigate through your slides if they're not using a mouse. So what I'm gonna be doing is switching back and forth between uh, my slides as well as um, some samples. So let me pull up um, my sample. I have entirely too many windows open. I'm sure you, I'm sure you know the feeling. So let me get that sample going for you. Um, and so I'm, I have a little, I have a fake grocery store that I own. It's called Xanners. And I have some training here on how to uh, be a bagger at Xanners. And so we're gonna pull that up and we're going to see how things are different in the new player, in the new way of being. So close some other tabs here. In the past, if I have a mobility concern and I can't use a mouse, I would use my keyboard to navigate. And what I would do is I would press the tab key to go to different objects. So if I, in the old version, if I press tab, the first thing I'd go to is handling meat and seafood. But if I press tab, you see that very faint yellow box around ready to eat. It skipped over handling meat and seafood. If I do shift tab to go backwards, it still doesn't go to handling meat and seafood. I hit tab again, tab, tab. I go to that hyperlink, but I don't get that text. That is one of the biggest fundamental differences in the new version of Storyline. And you don't have to do anything as the author. It's just how the software works with a screen reader. And what it does is if you are, um, if you have a mobility challenge, you're not using a screen reader to read to you what's happening, you can see that just fine. You can see handling meat and seafood just fine. So there's no reason to tab to it. So the big improvement they made is they've separated out what someone who can't see needs with someone who can't use a mouse but can see. So before, everybody had to tab through everything. But if I can see, I don't need to touch all of the plain text. I only need to navigate to the interactive elements. So I can use tab or shift tab to go through the different objects. And then I press either space or enter to activate them. So now if I press tab, I'm gonna skip over that text and go straight to the close button. So this is a really great usability enhancement for folks who, who can see just fine and don't need a screen reader. It's gonna be a lot less tabbing for them. It only tabs to the objects they need to interact with. Now, if you're used to the old way or your users are used to the old way where they tab to everything, it's gonna feel like it doesn't work. So you need to make sure everybody who's accessing your courses, either as reviewers or learners, knows about this difference. Now you might think, well, if they have a mobility problem, can they even use a keyboard? Well, um, our job is to get it to work with the keyboard and it's their technology's job to make the difference. So if I can't use my hands at all, uh, I might use an eye tracker or even a sip and puff device. I don't have to worry about testing my course on a sip, sip and puff device. If I can get it to work on a keyboard, their technology takes care of the rest. So that's how it works with a, um, if you don't have a screen reader running. 
If you do have a screen reader running, you navigate in two ways. So what I'm going to do is I am going to, on, let me head out of this. I'm trying to find my NVDA. Here we go. I'm going to pull up NVDA, the uh, screen reader. And so it's going to fight me a little bit as we talk. That is and we're just going to have to run with That's that. Hang on. There we go. Comment. Click on NV show speech viewer. Yeah. So I'm going to mute my computer for just a minute and show you what we're looking at here. NVDA. If I have a screen, so I have a screen reader running, and a screen reader is for folks who are visually impaired, cannot see those words, cannot see images, and the screen reader is going to read it to them. And so what I have here, this panel on the side, is a text version of what's being announced, just so that uh, that can help, because sometimes it goes by really fast, and sometimes um, for me as a developer, it's helpful, helpful for me to see what's happening um, as I'm listening. So what you'll hear is that automated voice. And uh, I'll walk through how it works. So I'm going to turn my audio back on. And I'm going to refresh the slide. Bagger and VDA speech viewer. There we go. Slide. And we can meet and see food. So it is automatically reading the slide title NVDA. that's NVDA. over here. NVDA. So it's reading that NVDA. slide title. NVDA. We'll talk about that in a minute. NVDA speech viewer. Okay. Now, if I tab. Edit read only multiple. Yeah. Clickable ready to eat button. It tells me it's a button and it's reading me the text. So you see how I, I'm skipping Wrong. over and I'm just button. getting the interactive element. Wrong. Wrap button. Guidance on sanitation for deli slicers visited link. You see how it's still skipping over the text? So if you're using a screen reader, you would still tab to interactive objects, but you can use the arrow key to get to all of them. So let me shift tab to back up. Shift tab. Wrong. Shift tab. Wrong. Shift tab. I'm going to press the enter key. Ready to read heading level two. And I'm going to press, I would press tab if I wanted to go to the next interactive element, which is the close button, but I would click the down arrow if I want the text. Meat or seafood that is already cooked and ready to eat should be treated like all other. And it only does a little chunk at a time, so I have to press my down arrow ready key to, to keep going. This includes list with three items, bullet lunch meat, bullet rotisserie chicken, Bullet meat from our food bar. Okay, I'm going to mute my, my uh, computer again. So that's the big difference. If you are not using a screen reader, it skips all text or non-interactive objects, and it only gets you the interactive objects, which is a huge usability improvement for that audience. If you are using a screen reader, you can tab to the interactive objects, or you can arrow to get to everything. Uh, some other... Um, Things that make that are a little bit easier now as well is um, if a student is using keyboard shortcuts with a screen reader, they can read just a word, or just a sentence. They have a lot more control over how the content is read. Again, you don't have to do anything in that area. It's just happening behind the scenes for you and for that. Okay. So, uh, again, if you have questions along the way, chime in over the phone line or put them into chat. So let me go back to uh, this. So that is focus order. Uh, and one other thing about focus order is that is handled via the, let me move the screen reader over. That is handled via the focus order dialog box. It used to be called the tab order dialog box. So that's where you would set up what order they would go in. So if I tab, what's the order? You want to make sure the buttons are in the right order and the instructions are in the right order. So this dialog box hasn't changed except for its name. Okay, so let me go back to my presentation. So that is focus order, big, big change there, good change. Um, now, when I was, um, let me, actually, I don't think I showed you this. So let me go back to the course. Yeah, that is, the course is right here. There we go. So let me go all the way through. Raw sealed, raw wrapped, hyperlink back to top. That's not new, but it's new that everybody sees it. And by, by the way, when I say new, I say new as of January last year. They've been rolling out these changes incrementally throughout 2020. So December of 2019, you couldn't see that. Starting in, I think, January, you could. So that has been there for a little while longer, but before it was only visible uh, to screen reader users. 
but now it's visible to everybody. So what is that for? Well, what, it, what happens is if I go, once I go through my content and I keep tabbing, I'm gonna go through the player element. See all of that? So let's say I'm, I'm, going, I'm back now in the slide content. Let's say I'm done with the slide and I wanna go back to the beginning. Well, I really don't wanna to have to go through volume, previous, next, menu, glossary, resources to get to the top. So what that does is when they come to this object and they tab to it and press enter, it takes them back to the top and they don't have to go. It's a way to skip the player if they want to go back to the beginning of the slide. So it's a usability enhancement. So again, that's not new, but before only screen reader users saw it, but now anybody using the keyboard will see it, which is good because um, folks with a mobility challenge would benefit from that as well. Now, if you don't like that and you want to um, turn that off, you can, on, you can do that in the player controls. So in the player controls, there's this checkbox here that says disable skip navigation shortcut. Now, if somebody's using a mouse, they'll never see this. It's only somebody who's using their tab key who would see that, but you can turn it off if you don't want to. That's one of the, the broad improvements uh, Storyline uh, Articulate made is um, more ways to customize how you want some of these features to look. Okay, uh, the other thing you can now change is focus color. So see this yellow box? It's actually very hard to see on a white background. So one of the things that they have given us is on the colors and effects tab is you can now change the accessibility focus color. So if you don't want that yellow box and you want it to be black, that's great. Um, I like that change. It is one color for the whole project. So if you have dark slides and light slides, you need to be careful. I could change it to black, but then what if I have a dark slide? The black's not gonna be visible. So you really need to plan your overall design to allow for the, for a one color of rectangle to work no matter where your buttons and interactive objects are placed. Okay, so that is a uh, focus order and a uh, focus color. Oh look, I made it easier to see. Okay, the next one is text style. So let me go back to the uh, finished course and I will pull my screen reader back up so that we can see what's going on. I'm gonna keep my volume off so I'm not fighting with the screen reader. So I'm gonna go back to, let me tab through this and go back to the top of the page. So ignore, ignore, ignore. Okay, so if you take a look in the bottom of that screen reader, notice it says, handling meat and seafood heading level one. So Storyline now has styles, just like in Word. If you've ever used heading one and heading two in Word, they now exist in Storyline. And there's a couple of advantages that I'll talk about. So there we have heading one, and now I'm gonna go and do ready to eat. And do you see how the screen reader would have just announced ready to eat heading level two? So if you and I can see this slide, we can tell that ready to eat is a heading because of its placement, because of its font, because of its color, because of its bolding. But if you can't see, it's just any other text, and so you don't necessarily notice that there's a hierarchical relationship. So if we apply these levels to our headings, that's gonna help someone who's using a screen reader to figure out the hierarchy that anybody who can see is picking up practically subconsciously. Like we're not even giving it a second thought but we are interpreting information from the size, placement, and weight of some of this text. So we now have the ability to provide that for our students. So let me go back to Storyline uh, and move this over. And styles are awesome for a hundred reasons. I mean, I, I love styles. Um, what you would do is you would um, take your item here that we wanna have heading one and you'd apply heading one here, simple. And it attaches, you see there that little H1 that tells you that behind the scenes it's gonna be called heading one. And here on my list here, I've assigned this to be heading two. So then I would do the same here. I'd go to seal and I would apply heading two. Now you need to do this purposefully. Some people will use these just for the font formatting. So let's say that here, um, I wanna put a little button that says hint. So let's say I'm gonna insert a button 
right here and I want it to be a white button with a blue border and I want it to say hint and I go, oh, um, I'd like, oh, uh, mm. sorry, all of my, my headings are different here because I'm using different masters. So you do need to, your styles apply to the master and apparently I have more than one master theme in here. So sorry about that. Let me move this button over to here. It doesn't make sense anymore, but so now I would say, oh, I like that font formatting. I'm going to use that, but center it. You don't want to do that because this is going to have the heading to tag and that button is not a heading to meaning. So if you want your buttons to have that font, make a special style. You can make your own styles. So don't apply heading one, two, three, and four to anything unless it really means heading one, two, three, and four. Make another one. And when you do, when you make your own style, so I'll call this my uh, teal on white button style, I am going to say, just make that normal text. There, so now I have the exact same formatting in two places. One, it gets the heading two tag. One, it gets just the I'm plain old regular text tag. So styles are awesome in terms of consistency, um, of formatting, they're great for branding, they're great for efficiency, but they also have a big impact for accessibility. So let me take a look. I've got a couple more items here and then I'm gonna pause for some questions. Okay, so we looked at the headings here. Uh, the other thing is that there's some extra details happening behind the screen for a screen reader that you don't have to do anything about. So for example, with our course here, uh, yeah, pulled up the wrong screen. There we go. So if I pull this up and pull my um, screen reader over, let me go back to this bulleted list here. So I'm going to tab. Let me go. Let me start back at the top, and I'm going to arrow down. So level two, ready to eat. We already talked about that. Meat or seafood. So you can read here what the screen reader is reading in that panel. This includes. List with three items, lunch meat, rotisserie chicken, meat from our food bar, out of list. So that's something that didn't happen before. If you had a bulleted or numbered list, a screen reader would not know it's a bulleted or numbered list. And sometimes that's really important information. You don't have to do anything to make that happen. It's just um, automatically happening behind the scenes. Some of the other things that happen behind the scenes, I think it's shift F7. I can't remember the shortcut. There's a shortcut in many screen readers that let um, that shows keyboard shortcuts that I can use with my screen reader. So for example, if I'm using a screen reader, I can press the B key on my keyboard and it will cycle through all the buttons. If I click, I think the L key or something, it, it will cycle through all the links. And so in the past, storyline content didn't work with those standard shortcuts. And now these courses operate more like the rest of the web world. Again, you don't have to make that happen. So a lot of the improvements are behind the scenes. And I love that. We have a better accessible product and yet I don't have to do work for it. So that's the best of all possible worlds. Okay, I'd like to stop and pause, see if anybody has any questions. Anything in chat or in the um, over the phone line? I have a couple of questions, Diane. Yeah, what you got? Okay, first up with the text styles, now that we have the headings, uh, which is great, are those heading levels made available via a shortcut in the screen reader, a keyboard shortcut, so that a blind user comes to a slide and they can skim through the different heading levels, or do they have to tab to, uh, see them uh, or perceive them sequentially. I believe that it does. I'm going to, I'm, I'm, unless anybody happens to know, I'm forgetting the keyboard shortcuts that brings up the keyboard shortcuts in MBDA. So I'm doing a quick Google short, Google um, search for that. But if anybody happens to know, let me know. And let's, let's pull it up and try it right now. 
Um, let's see, keyboard shortcut. Let me just pull it here for everybody to see. Let's see what I'm doing. Um, it's a keyboard shortcut to figure out keyboard shortcuts. There's one here. Okay, go to next heading is H. Let's see if that works, but I'm pretty sure it does. Let's see. So if I go to H, yeah. Let me let me start over at the top of the slide. Back to top. So let me just go to the middle of the slide and now I'll press H. There we go. It went to heading level one. So yes, the H key does work to go to heading level one. I think it's the B key. Yep. So it's going right through my uh, my B and then I think it's shift B goes backwards. Yep. It's going through all of my buttons using the B key. So this is, these are keyboard shortcuts that a screen reader user would know about their own software, and it does vary based on which screen reader the person has. Okay? Good. Um, other questions? If I may ask one more, uh, with the, it's related to color contrast with the uh -huh. players. Mm -hmm. Do we now have uh, players that are are the are, let me say this differently are the players that are available to us uh color contrast compliant from top to bottom or are there any issues there there are there are a few issues um and i know they are all um likely to release improvements soon i know this is something they're actively working on i've even seen a mock-up of it so i don't know how quickly so right now I'm showing the um, classic player and the classic player, in my opinion, is still the most accessible and we'll talk about why. Um, actually, they fixed one of the issues. So the main issue is the color contrast. So on the classic, you control every color. And so you can manage it. The one thing that is not fully accessible is the menu because only color can be used to indicate whether or not something has been visited or not. There is no other way to do that. And programmatically, a screen, so someone who can't see color might not be able to tell what has and hasn't been visited. And a screen reader won't pick up that information at all. And so they are working on a version that has icons instead, and that that information can be picked up by a screen reader. So once that's done, I'm going to say that we're pretty compatible. I'm, I don't believe the logo panel um, allows for alt text. So that's a, that's a little bit of a ding, but you, you, know, you don't have to use the logo panel. The modern player, however, and I do have the same version of this course available in the modern player. So let me pull that up on my other monitor. There we go. So here's the modern player and it cannot be made with enough color contrast. It can't. You only can pick darker light and you can only pick one accent color. So you can make sure that has good contrast. But like their visited state here, the visited on the menu, you can't change that color and there is not enough contrast. Um, I don't believe this is enough contrast for small text. So in my opinion, you cannot use the modern player if you're using the menu and resources for a, a fully accessible course. I do know they're working on fixing that. Okay. Thank you. Good. Other questions? Well, let's go back to our um, example. Okay, oh, the other thing that's important um, is that the screen reader automatically reads the slide title. And I don't mean this text box. Yes, it will read that text box if you have it, but it will read whatever goes over here. So I, if I don't use a menu, I often don't worry about being perfect on titling these, but, the screen reader will pick it up even if you don't have the menu. So always make sure that you're naming these well and checking your spelling. So regardless of what you have here, it will read this. So that's good to know. Okay, another thing that's new is hyperlinks. In the past, you could not um, access text-based hyperlinks with a screen reader. Um, so now if I tab to through the buttons and now I tab to that hyperlink, uh, it is now treated like a button, and that never happened before. So I'm very happy about that. We used to do all kinds of crazy workarounds if we wanted a hyperlink. We'd use a button that looks like text, and 
other crazy things. So love, love, love that we don't have to do that workaround anymore. Uh, another thing is keyboard shortcuts. Now, what I mentioned a minute ago was that Storyline works better with the keyboard shortcuts in the screen reader software. So if someone's visually impaired, they might be using JAWS or NVDA, and that software has keyboard shortcuts. However, all students now have Storyline specific keyboard shortcuts that they can choose from. So let me pull the course back up again. If I press question mark, if I press question mark, why is it not happening? Why is it not working? You're embarrassing me, Storyline. Let me try this one. Hang on. I found, you know what? I've had days where this works and days where it doesn't. So I tested it this morning and it came right up. So I'm going to switch to my screen capture here. This is what should happen. If a, if a student presses the question mark key, they can see all of the available keyboard shortcuts in the course. Now, what you can also do is just provide them with some of this information. And this is a good example of how accessible design can be good for everybody, because anybody can use these keyboard shortcuts. So it's all control, all plus a letter that makes sense. So as I'm going through this, if I am um, playing a course, so let me pull back to um, my course here. Hang on. There we go. So as I go through here, if I do Control Alt N, it should go to the next. Okay, nothing's working for me right now. Absolutely nothing's working for me right now. So um, we're just going to have to run with it. I don't understand why this isn't working. I think if you have you have to set up in the player to have the um, accessibility control allowing sh uh, keyboard shortcuts. I don't, I didn't think that was the case. Uh, we can try it and find out. We will talk about the accessibility controls, but it's my understanding that it was different. So we will play with that and figure it out. Um, because I will talk, why don't I talk about the accessibility controls and then we'll go from there. But basically you can play and pause, you can mute and unmute, you can toggle closed captionings, you can go next and back all with keyboard shortcuts. And for someone with a mobility challenge, that is huge because they can quickly go to what they want and what they need, and they don't have to go around uh, tabbing through everything to figure it out. I especially like to play pause for the folks who have uh, screen readers going, because you're, if you have narration, your narration is playing while their screen reader is playing. And so if they can do a quick mute or a quick pause without having to tab through everything to get to it, that's a huge um, improvement. And again, it's better for everybody. So I'd encourage you to let your students know through some level of instruction that those shortcuts exist um, for everybody. And hopefully I'll be able to demonstrate them for you soon. Okay, so that's a list. Here's a list of what they all should be. Um, so another option here is accessible text. You see this toggle accessible text. What is accessible text? Here is a slide with just standard text. And a screen reader will read it, but it doesn't act like text on a regular web page. So there is an option that you can either turn on for your students or that they can turn on via the shortcut or some other controls I'll show you in a minute. They can turn on what's called accessible text. And so this is what the same slide looks like with accessible text. You see it's not very different. And actually the picture doesn't get bigger. I think that's just, um, a fluke in my slide. But you see how I get that little scroll bar and the G is in the wire cut off? Basically, it means that the text is being treated more like web page text. Why would you want that? Because you might have folks who have special software that can modify the text. So let's say that I have dyslexia. There's certain things about font choice, spacing, size, that can make it easier or harder for me to read. And so I can have a plugin on my browser, like the plugin Helper Bird, that lets me change the spacing. So if accessible text is turned off and it's a standard storyline course and I turn on my Helper Bird, the text won't change. But if I activate accessible text and I turn on my Helper Bird, 
I can make the course look like this by overriding your font choices with my font choices. And this is a font that's specifically designed for folks who are dyslexic. Now notice it's not gonna all fit now. I even now have a scroll bar up here, even though it mostly fits. I mean, it fits just fine, but it's technically a little cut off, so it's giving me a scroll bar. So it does mean that it will, it will make your layout look weird, um, but everything should have a scroll bar, so your learner should still be able to do it. So that's a really nice setting, in my opinion. So let's talk about some of these settings and where they exist. So now in the player controls um, dialog box, there is a checkbox here where you can add accessibility controls. It is enabled by default on all new projects. It is disabled by default on any existing projects. And it puts out this little gear icon. And with that gear icon, the students can turn on or off Zoom to Fit, which we'll talk about in a minute, accessible text, and they can even turn off the keyboard shortcut. Like if I have special software, maybe Storyline's keyboard shortcut is something I use for something else. So, you know, we're just giving the learners more chances. So here I can turn on, I'm giving the student the option to turn that on. So if I preview this, actually I think I need to publish this slide. I'll do. Uh, and I'll show you what that looks like now. And we'll see if uh, the keyboard shortcuts work now. Okay, so let me first try the keyboard shortcuts, question mark. Question mark is not working. I have, I have been finding that since they released it. Sometimes I get it to work and sometimes I don't. So I'm gonna talk to them about that bug. Uh, but here's my controls. And so I can turn on the accessible text. And you see it just did a little shift. You see, it's not a big difference, but there is a difference. And then I, ha I do have the helper bird plugin. And so I can do things like I can say, I want to use my own size, my own spacing, my own line height. I can do whatever I want and activate it. And clearly I'm not activating it properly. But did I, I'm missing something. I'm, I am not on a roll today, am I? Okay. Um, well, you saw what it should look like. And I'm not a helper bird user in my normal life. But that's what it would do is it would overwrite the text formatting. And it might look weird, but at least it might be more functional for some folks. So that's the accessibility controls, one of the options uh, there. So one of the other options there is Zoom to fit. This was one of the other reasons I never used the modern player for um, accessible courses. And so let me explain, let me demonstrate why we don't want, why, why it was an issue in the past and why it's better now. One of the things that the uh, WCAG requirements, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines say is that a learner should be able to magnify your course by 200%. So if I go in here and I magnify by 200%, look what's happening. My content's actually getting smaller. Like that's the reverse of what we want. And the reason it's happening is because the player frame is responding to that magnification and the modern player is designed to always fit everything. So as the player gets bigger, it's being helpful and making the content smaller. So it's exactly what we didn't want. So that's one of the reasons I never did the modern player. I'm going back to 100%. But if we turn on Zoom to fit, then you see what happens is I can keep going and going out at a certain point, you know, they're gonna have to scroll so much that it may not be helpful, but it means they can use magnification. And the uh, WCAG guidelines say that they, uh, they only need to go to 200%. So now my course, Yes, they'd have to scroll, but it is still fully functional at 200%. So that is Zoom to fit. Let me put this all back to the regular. Now, both the Zoom to fit and the accessible text are managed via, via variables as well. So if you want to change the default, you can. By default, accessible text is turned off. By default, Zoom to fit is turned off. If you want to change that, you can go into your built-in variables and zoom to fit, 
you can change the default to true. They'll still be able to toggle it on and off. It just changes what happens when the player starts. So you can change the default setting for accessible text, closed captionings, and Zoom to fit by changing these. Otherwise, the learner can change them on the fly. Okay, let me stop here and see what questions you have. Anything else I can address? Um, so I have, I know it's not working right now. Of course, that's how it works. Um, so when to, to pull up the little menu for the keyboard shortcuts, they just have to yeah. push the question mark or is it like shift question mark or it's just. Well, the, the official guidance is shift question mark, but shift question mark is question mark. Okay. Question right. mark is technically shift slash. So to me, shift question mark is like saying ATM machine. Like the yeah. M is already machine, but nobody <laughs> says AT machine. So just question mark, question mark actually mean the same thing. And then and then it will pull up that little picture you showed us of the menu? It's supposed to. Okay. <laughs> it's supposed to, yes. So that okay. let me pull that slide back up. That is uh there we go. This is what they should see. Okay. They should see what they are and they can uh, enable or disable them from here as well. Cool. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that's Zoom to fit. Uh, we already talked about the accessibility controls and uh, you can turn them on and off in here. But remember, as I mentioned, they're turned off by default on um, current projects and uh, they are turned, wait, turned on by default on new projects, turned off by default on old projects. And you do need to make sure you match your, um, your color contrast on these. When they first came out with this menu, it was pulling colors from random places, like it's the background of the menu, but the dot of the volume slider. And so we were having really weird results where they didn't fit with color contrast, but now they're all their own um, color options in the menu. So you should be able to manage your own color contrast there. Okay, so those are really the big differences that have gone out in the last year. Um, and you saw some bugginess, and that is my experience as well. It's still not perfect. Um, I'll share with you some of the things I've encountered. I've encountered, like we said, sometimes I can get that menu to pop up, and sometimes I can't. I, I, I can't figure out a rhyme or reason. I'd like to. Um, the other thing I have found is that sometimes a screen will read automatically with a screen reader, and sometimes it won't. When Storyline released the first batch of these new enhancements last January, whenever a student arrived on a screen, the screen reader automatically read everything start to finish. And they got almost instant feedback, no, stop, don't, don't run the whole thing at once because it's going to fight with our audio, they lose control. And so they switched it back to what I showed you. It announces when you tab to things. I have found, though, that that's not always true. There will be some slides where it reads the whole thing automatically, some slides where it doesn't. I really hope they fix that because that's going to be confusing to a learner. How are they going to figure out a pattern? On this slide, it read everything. This slide, it read a little. Is that everything? I don't know. So I, I don't love that. So there are some things that are great, some things that are iffy. Um, I have found some issues with the visited states on buttons. So let me share with you um, what that looks like. Let me pull up the finished course. Here we go, and bring my screen reader back up. So here I have, shop. there we go, ready to eat, button. I press this button. You see when I go to uh, close overlay is the alt text I've put in on, I've put, did I just say put in? Uh, that I put on that, so it says close button, great. Now, notice it says visited ready to eat button. That's something that you need to do as the designer. For someone who can see, they can see that check mark and know what they have and haven't visited. So if I'm tabbing through now, I can see raw, I have not visited, wrapped, I have not visited, but I'm gonna shift, I'm gonna shift tab back. And so somebody who's using a screen reader gets the benefit of that check mark, basically. So that's something you need to do on the visited state. I have found some quirks with that. So let me show you what's going to happen right now. I'm going to go to press enter. And now I'm going to go back to that close button. You see how it says button three button? 
That is the same button I was on a minute ago. The same exact button that said close overlay. In fact, in the NBA speech viewer window, you can even see the second item, close overlay. Bottom, button three button. It's the same button. Why is that? Well, it took me a while to figure it out, but I did. So let me pull this up. The way you manage alt text for a visited state, you, you can, um, normally you manage alt text either with the accessibility tab on the size and position dialog box, or you can do it in the focus order dialog box. So where is it? Um, right, there we go, it's right there. So you can do it either of those places. Now in this case, it can just be plain text. You don't even need alt text because it's just text and screen readers read text. If you want to manage visited state text separately, you have to go into edit state, go to your visited state, pull up the size and position dialog box and manually type in what you want. Okay, so that's great. Now about this close button. So I went in to my uh, alt text and said close overlay. But this button happens to have a visited state. So what that meant is the first time I went through and I clicked the close button, it was reading the normal state alt text. I closed it once. When I came back, technically that button has been visited. So it was reading me the visited alt text, button three. What should happen is if I change the normal, it should carry through all of them. If I call normal close overlay, visited should have automatically been close overlay also. And then if I wanted to just say something then different than I do that, but it should have stayed consistent and it's not. So that means that you need to check all your visited states. Even if you think you don't need them, you don't need special alt text, it is um, doing something weird. So it's not perfect yet. I wish it was, but here's what I do know. I've been on the beta for the accessibility is they are really working hard on this. They're actively collecting feedback. So if you are having um, some challenges of your own as you test, let them know because they are really working on getting this right. Okay, I'd love to field any last questions. We've got a few minutes left. Um, what questions can I answer about accessibility? Anything at all? Hi, I have a question. Yeah, what you got? A workshop that's coming up on March 24th. What skill level okay. do you need to be able to attend that or to get the most okay. out of it? Good question. Yeah, let me pull up the, um, the website for that for everybody to see it. So it's a full day program that's a deep dive. So this was an overview. That's a deep dive hands on practice activities. Hang on, I can't seem to type today. That is best for someone who knows how to use Storyline in general, but you don't need to know anything about accessibility. If you do, great. There'll be some nice reviews for you. Here we go, it is the 24th, so thank you for looking that up. Um, so you don't need to know anything about screen readers or anything like that, but if you don't know how to make a button, I'm not gonna show you how to do a button. If you don't know what layers are, we're not gonna talk about what layers are. I'll show you how to make layers accessible, but I'm not gonna show you how to add a layer. So you should be reasonably functional in Storyline, but you don't need any special accessibility um, experience or knowledge. And um, I do recommend that you download, it says down here, I do recommend that you download a screen reader so that you can try out some of the things you're playing with. Um, NVDA is free. Uh, I do encourage you to make a donation uh, when you download it, um, but it doesn't have to be a big expensive thing like JAWS is many hundreds of dollars, but NVDA, I donate $35. Uh, and so I encourage you to um, have that available. Okay? Thank you. So that is on um, March 24th from 10 to 5 Eastern. Good. What else? Other questions? Okay, well, I really appreciate you all taking time out of your day. We want to make sure that the messages we are creating and the opportunities we are providing are available to everybody and that we're not picking and choosing who gets to have access to professional development opportunities. So I appreciate your commitment to making your courses more accessible.